first of all a good afternoon assalam alaikum myself uh, i am arun malachit i am the product specialist for secure envoy from bulwark technologies and along with me um, mr philip underwood he is the chief information officer at secure envoy so he will be the person who will actually drive the entire session for today so moving in to the session um uh, uh we want to discuss about the main agenda of today's session yeah so we will start with an introduction about bulwark and the secure envoy and uh, we will discuss about uh, different topics on identity access management like uh, exposure of the internet and the different non bounding issues and providing the identity uh, how we can make it simple the identity access management program and also what are the different challenges uh, related to the you know problems and passwords and also we also having a small practical demonstration and uh, we are trying to cover up the multi factor authentication technologies as well and finally we will have a uh, you know q and a session you can clarify all the uh, different you know clarifications and points related to the identity access management solution so moving into the introduction about uh, bulwark so bulwark as a value added distributor in the security and uh, we are uh, for the last 22 plus years in the middle east and also we are in india for the last 4 years so our company was established in 1999 in the middle east and also we, our indian office started in 2017 recently we also started our new office in saudi arabia in uh, in 2022 and uh, we are actually representing around you know 30 plus technology vendors and their complete portfolio in our you know complete stack we do have uh, different uh, partners across the middle east and uh, you know the indian regions so we having a complete excellent uh, you know track record and delivering the world class products and the complete excellent customer service our partners with the best breed of technology vendors and uh, you know we offer award winning products with excellent customer services also we deliver uh, around the clock value added distribution services through our different partner communities that's from the middle east saudi arabia as well as the indian subcontinent regions also we have worked an extended arm for our security vendor so for secure envoy also we having the complete uh, you know representation in the region promoting and the selling it security products and uh, you know we are actually dealing the complete uh, you know selling through our uh, reseller channel partners at like you so we do have the dedicated uh, you know sales right you know engineers who are ready to support you for your uh, you know pain points and uh, you know understanding the requirement and delivering the completion of the project so from here i'm just hand over to mr philip yeah over to you philip over to you philip cool thank you very much for the introduction so yeah philip underwood chief information officer at secure envoy um uh, first of all you have me for the next 30 to 40 minutes so i'm going to take you through a um, little bit of a storyline uh, both on background problem areas and where technology is helped with the whole um, identity process as set forth uh, any any q and a just add them into the, the chat windows and we'll have a session towards the end but just to get started again a little bit of history to user identity and it's very much been driven both from again i'm showing my age here uh, right back to the the 1980s when it's mainframe environments dumb terminals and you had a user account and that was the only way you could prove who you are when you connected on that that piece of wire to a a resource to access an application or data like everything in life this progress it evolved into the again John my age i can remember the, the first windows for works groups uh, ibm os2 were the first network in uh, operating systems and then to where we are very much today with a full heterogeneous environment of different technologies and where it really started to kick in was in the the 2000s when we had the, the world of pki certificates on websites and and that really developed the the whole e-commerce market and so everyone now has multiple identities they used to have multiple usernames and and password credentials to manage 
And the adoption's moved even further. So if we look back, you typically had applications running on mainframes, and now it's very much gone to being decentralized. And now obviously you have this full digital transformation into the cloud where we're actually using a lot more cloud-based uh, applications and, and consuming uh, cloud-based technologies. But the, the key thing behind all of this is when you connect on the wire, how do you actually prove your identity? So traditionally, this has been a username and password. So take the key, the key positives. Yeah, it's simple, it's inexpensive, it's easy to use, and, it, and it's used everywhere. So for end users, and if you look at the world today, there's what, 7.5 billion uh, users in the world. And if you just apply some statistics to that, uh, two thirds of those individuals will have access to a form of uh, electronic access, whether it's directly through cloud, web, mobile technologies. So again, the reach is to pretty much everyone we, we work with uh, in, in, and know of in our day to day. Now the bad point with um, proving your identity with a username and password is uh, as users, we are simple folk. We like something to be easy. We, we like to use the same credential everywhere. So they tend to be static, they tend to be used, and they tend to be weak. Now this is further exacerbated when we just try and understand how many identities and how many passwords you manage. Now, it's quite a sad fact. Um, I actually um, done a, a gap analysis of my family and we had something like 47 different accounts um, that we managed and that's everything from our AWS to, to Netflix to to Sky to your, your corporate logon with Office into various applications to e-commerce sites to web applications to, to gaming applications and when you start to add this up it's a massive overhead and it's not discerning to see why we do actually have problems with passwords so we just start to, to break that down when we start to look at uh, the problem with passwords is, again, every day in the news, you will see yet another data breach. And behind that, compromised credentials uh, are used in the majority of them. In Verizon's data breach survey 2021, um, they're now saying 61% of all breaches were attributed to leveraged credentials. That has now further extended the, in the online report. Uh, I checked last night, it's at 80%. Uh, this is everything from um, directory halving attacks, uh, phishing attacks, malware. So compromised credentials are running at 80% for all breaches. And that's not only compromised credentials, but also default accounts or easily guessable, um, as in known in the arts. There's uh, a lot of, um, again, Troy Hunt, a great researcher from Microsoft. There's a, a wonderful website uh, where you can actually check various credentials to see if they've uh, been on any different uh, paste bins or dark web. But the problem we have today is, as of now, 24 billion accounts are compromised, and the majority of them are within various WinRAR files, SQL DB downloads, and they are for sale on the dark web. Now, when you look at the bad actors, there's different groups who are actually exchanging information. So they're not only taking your username and password credential, they're then looking for other digital information about you regarding things like your, your name, your date of birth, your address. And again, these credentials are being swapped and obviously merged together to provide a much more informed uh, account of who you are as an individual. And again, these then will have a higher selling cost. So this is all happening in the background. And if we just look, um, everyone probably remembers this, I do. LinkedIn was probably the first large account breach. Now, this happened in 2012. So we're only talking one decade ago. And in those 10 years, we now have gone from zero to 24 billion accounts that have been compromised and are potentially for sale on the web. Now, when LinkedIn first happened, six and a half million accounts was their first um, understanding of, of what had been compromised. And 
after months of forensics, they realized it was actually 117 million user accounts were actually, uh, were actually compromised and actually pushed out into the, uh, the public domain. So we understand passwords are ubiquitous, passwords are used everywhere, but how do we actually get to the next stage of proving our identity safely? And this is where multi-factor authentication uh, has been around in the marketplace for a number of years. It's very much now becoming a de facto technology, which is great. However, can you afford to take multi-factor for your AWS, for your Google, for your Microsoft, uh, for your web access? Again, can you afford to have this uh, token necklace, as in the, these multiple authenticators you actually have to manage? So when we talk about multi-factor, it's all about using more than one piece to actually prove your identity. So there's three parts to multi-factor for users. So we've got the, the base, there's something you know, which could be a PIN, a, a personal identification number or a password. We've got the something you have. So this is something physical, something tangible to use in individuals. So we've got a token. So you've got the, the, the good old days of um, the hardware token manufacturers. We had a piece of plastic with a display and a, and a uh, six digit code or grade that we presented. You've got USB keys, and again, they do have their place. You've got a phone and other devices and then other hardware tokens. And again, with all of these, we can use it in a number of ways. We can either send like a, a one time passcode via SMS, via email, it could be generated on a, a soft token application. We could use voice. Voice can be used in two ways. We talk about uh, matching voice context, as in the way you speak, or using the voice channel to actually deliver a one-time passcode. The interesting one there is you said about voice, the, the USB key. Now, the USB keys are getting greater adoption. They're becoming more secure. The problem with some of this technology is all it proves is a device was used with a user. It doesn't prove the user behind the device. So again, we, there's, a, there's some disparate gaps, and we'll, we'll discuss this as we move through the, uh, the presentation. And the final one are, is there something you are? And again, it comes down to biometrics. So you've got your face, your iris, and your fingerprint. Now, biometrics are great. The only hurdle you're going to need to really understand with the biometrics is what happens if you're fingerprint is compromised okay so you have to revoke that fingerprint i now have nine others i can use so you have a form of recovery that gets defeated quite quickly when we look at iris if one of your iris biometrics is compromised or it has to be revoked you only have one and you only have one face again it's all about using the correct technology in the right arena now when we look at the authentication types again see at Scrimvoy, we've got a, a broad portfolio of authenticators we can use and this provides users with choice so again two things one you can from a security standpoint two from a user acceptance now both are very key when you make decisions and the theme of today is all about making it simple for users um, give an example we've got a project at the moment where we're working uh, with a, an energy company on they want to use voice call because the voice landline number is already within their database. It proves it's actually registered that home address. They already have captured this information. So again, it's all about using the right tactic for the right solution and obviously have that end user acceptance. But from us, again, having that, that broad range of portfolio allows greater flexibility. Now, with all of this, it does provide some user interaction. And even with this and simple solutions, people do struggle. So what we've seen now in the marketplace is this whole transition into what we call a push technology. Now with push, let's bring my laser up, a couple of things to remember is there's, there's two parts to a push solution. So one is you actually have to register with the push service. So just to set a number of myths clear, when you use a push service, the push service is nothing to do with Secure Envoy or any other uh, authentication vendor, the push service comes from the phone operating service provider. So we're talking about Google and we're talking about Apple. What will happen is we have to go through a 
number of conditions to meet. So when we enroll, you can actually set yourself up for enroll so you can actually do this as a user. When you use the phone as the next step, by interacting with the enrollment page, your phone device will actually interact with the phone OS service provider. So it's a Google, um, Apple, and again, we also have Windows. Again, that, that, that service is now being deprecated, but it still has uh, some value at the moment. And what it will do, it will take uniques from your mobile device, provide you with a unique push ID, which your phone can then push back into the enrollment server, and then that's then captured. So as we go to the next step, so the sequence it looks quite convoluted, but it's actually very, very simple. So we take our user, so the user's accessing a resource. In this example, we're using a VPN. VPN passes the request to the, the screw invoice server. Again, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, it, it, it doesn't really matter. This is just really to take you through. Now, the screw invoice server at that point will look up the user, look up the push ID, pull out to the relevant push provider, which then sends the notification. At that point, that will then interact with the app. The app will then go and check for the access condition. Is there an ongoing access request? If it is, it'll end the poll, and obviously then we can send back a one-time passcode or other unique information to prove the validity of the user connecting. And then what we do through on the back end is we stitch all this together through a session and understand the user and obviously provide the access. Now, the great thing with push, as you've probably seen, is you get the notification, you do an access, accept or reject, and the user sign is, it makes it really, really simple. However, with push, does it have its failings? Um, you can cause classes of push fatigue. If there's like a brute force attack on an account, um, users can say deny, 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 and then by being annoyed, they can then press the accept, and that's all the bad guys are playing on. So what we can do with Secure Envoy, we can actually further make this more sticky by bringing biometrics. So you have to unlock the response with a biometric or PIN. So again, it just takes us to the, the next level of one, keeping it simple, but also keeping that uh, security level high. As we go through, so we can understand about the authenticators. We know we've got to have a better way of proving identity. But how do you embrace this technology? How do you actually get the service set up and running? How do we actually overcome the whole onboarding issue? And there's a number of things we need to overcome. So first of all, all my data is in Active Directory. It may be in a Azure Active Directory. I may have a hybrid model where I'm using two user data repositories. I might be completely brand new, you can use something like Google. So we have very simple methods to actually take and synchronize data into our cloud offering. And we can sync this over obviously a secure session. And the first thing we can do is obviously provide that whole access into to cloud applications. Because this is where the market's going and everyone has this uh, keen adoption for digital transformation cloud first, which is great. However, what happens when we want to have the legacy applications? What about my firewalls? What about my VPNs? What about my other remote access methods? How do I actually support other technologies? Anything that could be radius based, which is a 1960s protocol, but again, it still has a lot of value to date. And also other web applications. How do you still support this? How do I still support my ongoing enterprise network? So, let me take you through and then we'll get into some of the demonstrations. So one of the first ways we can do this is we've got a very simple way to actually do the whole user provisioning. And we can do this across a Microsoft Active Directory on-premise environment. We can do it with Azure AD, a Google Directory, where any of the users that's created, as long as they're in a respective group, we can then automatically synchronize them to the secure envoy what we call the universal directory. Once they're provisioned in here, we can send an auto email enrollment. And then at this point, the user can access the portal. So this does throw up two things. So up to here, everything's really seamless. Of course, the first question is, well, what credentials do they access the user portal with? 
So obviously they have their user ID, but what about uh, their access password as a first level? How do they actually get in? So within the software, we've done a, a number of things to actually make the directory sync very, very simple. So again, see here we've got import users, export user groups, export user groups to give you the start. So this is where we can actually be the source of truth. So you may have multiple directories and multiple directory types you're working with, but we can actually be the source of truth to actually have that complete management. And you can see on here, we can actually go even further. So we can do custom attributes if you have something uh, explicit to your network. And also, as I said before, the whole onboarding with the users. So we can actually also sync and keep the passwords instead. For example, we can import the passwords for the first part of the enrollment. If the password change in the cloud, we can sync it back to the on-premise. And if the password change on premise, we can sync it back to the cloud. So we can keep everything in step. So we're now getting to the, the next point of, we've got the users, we've got the authenticators, we've got a great way of onboarding and also managing the, the, the whole password issue as in existing passwords to support them both on the initial enrollment, but also for the ongoing lifetime of that user. But when we get into the solution side, yes, we can do the whole single sign-on to cloud application. So we've got support for WSFED and SAML, so the, the, the two main authentication protocols. We also got great radius integration, so we can integrate with a wide range of um, other technologies. But not only that, we, we can also support with our software um, both Microsoft desktop and server logons, so we can and also Mac. And these are done with what's called an agent. So it allows both a two-factor approach to the console or remote desktop. And we also have a really clever way to actually uh, do what we call an offline support. So this is where you have a, uh, a laptop, like a traveling worker, completely disconnected, no Wi-Fi, no data, and we can still support them with a two-factor experience. In addition to that, we can still support Microsoft RD Gateway, RD Web, ADFS environments, Microsoft IS web environments. And we can do this with that, that great range of flexible authentication options. So again, it's not just about supporting the cloud. Again, there's a whole raft of other access and applications to support within your environment. When we talk about access, again, one of the things that comes up is obviously about location. Now, Secure Envoy is something we've done um, to really drill down into this is to have some really explicit location control. So we can do this in two ways. We have both a safe zone, so we can actually set a, a perimeter. So if you look at the uh, the bottom left-hand side, you can see um, yeah, a smaller radius of having to be within that proximity to authenticate, or you have a large one to provide some more flexibility of users. So that's the first stage. You can have explicit zones configured, and there's, there's no limit to the number of these. And the second one is we can also then have what we call a request response deviation. So we can actually set parameters of where the requests come from to where the response was set. Now, to make that work, we obviously need to be very clever with how we detect uh, the inbound connection and also where the push response is sent. So with our soft token, we take multiple metrics. We don't just use the GOIP. So we know that can be spoofed, um, it may not be accurate. Whereas a lot of other companies will use that approach to give them, give them something tangible. But we take multiple metrics from the mobile device to actually have a more guaranteed location and much more explicit control for user company to understand your users and where they're accessing applications from. Because for some companies, it may be you've got jurisdictions that you can't do a financial transaction across boundaries, as in geographical or regional boundaries. And also, we've seen this post-COVID and home working. Majority of our customers want to have some explicit controls on the, the home workers and where they're connecting from. So again, it, it moves us into some uh, more use cases. So well, we're going to get into the, um, the demonstration. So we've actually got some videos recorded of um, created and there's a number of demos we'll go through. So we'll show you the, the, uh, the Active Directory synchronization agent, how 
we can get that whole sync process. So we're going to go right back to basics. We can create a brand new user. We're then going to allow them to be synced. You're going to see the uh, email alert and enrollment, and then how we can actually complete the enrollment with a, a soft token and a push, understand the cl and assign cloud applications, and then finally close out with you know, one final um, login. So let me move on to the next. And just one second. Turn off the pointer and then we can get back to, here we go. So I'll let the video run, I'll do the voiceover. So this is my uh, 2012, so you can see it's uh, a lot of flexibility on how we can uh, deploy and support various environments. So we have a number of agents, but the one we're talking about here is the Microsoft Active Directory Sync Agent. Now, the way it works is we have uh, obviously a top level. So we have the uh, the tenant. So this is the, the cloud tenants connected with. We obviously have the username, password, and we can see it's so connected and it's obviously the first step of the domain. Now within here, we obviously have um, the connection to the Active Directory. So this is where we can support LDAP. So with LDAP, we can support not only the base LDAP, we can do uh, SSL, we can actually do sign in, we can actually do an anonymous connection, we can also do a read only. So we have great flexibility how we can bring in. Now as we move through, again, we can now select what is the outbound. Is it an OU, is it a group? And then on the respective, when we push information back, what is the inbound OU, what is the inbound group we're going to be connecting to? So again, all of this we can just read in at time of configuration. So I'm walking through everything, and then from here we can turn on synchronization, set the sync time, and also we have a service port for obviously um, ongoing password changes. And again, that's pretty much it. So what we're going to do now is the next stage is, here's my Active Directory. Um, now within that OU, we're monitoring, I'm going to create a brand new user, and nothing spectacular with this, it's just, uh, but it just shows you how we go from start to finish. This is a brand new user in Active Directory, and then you'll see the whole sync process. Now just for demos, I'm going to use a very part on the password, yeah, create a password for the domain complexity. Once complete, there's a few little uh, finishes, and then, yeah, so brand new user, now at this point, uh, provide an email address. And that's pretty much all the information we need other than the group membership to actually make this work. Now, before we start the group, I'm just gonna jump over into our Universal Directory channel, which is cloud-based. So this is within Amazon AWS, our public cloud. And you can see there's no WLA13 user within this. So jump back to the domain. And at this point, we'll put the user into the group. Now we know from our configuration in 10 seconds time, um, we'll actually do a poll and a synchronization. So there's my sync group, put the user in. Yeah, let's continue to apply, except everything's good. Now at this point, everything will now kick off seamlessly in the background. So first thing we can do, we can actually go and do a, a search again. And now if you look, you'll see WA13, and we can see the user's not configured. So there's the user, um, any other base information is, is in the UD. And finally, we get a, an alert email. And we can see there, there's the account, and it's telling us to use our existing AD password because we've synchronized that across as well. Provide a sign-in link for the user, and that allows the user to now, their existing user ID, their existing domain password. So at this point, they're still authenticating with something they know, and we can now complete their user enrollment. So again, through policy, we can say what they can have. At this point, we're going to actually use the soft token. You see, we've got that by default from the admin configuration, we have the push enabled. The only thing I can't demonstrate is the actual enrollment from the mobile phone side because we, with our software, we have some clever ways we stop screen casting or any screen captures. So at this point, you can install the app, run the app, 
complete the push and once that's happened yeah the user is now authenticated and signed in so this point this is the user portal so you have obviously different levels you obviously have the main admin we have then the user portals and the help desk we have various role based so what we'll do now is on the groups we're now going to add our user wa13 into the, the cloud apps group and if you look you will then see we've got three provision applications in that group and at that point we're going to log out log back in and you'll then see those provisioned applications but now when we log in we'll actually see the user complete the push response as well so with a mobile device again we can support biometrics so here we can see with the push so it's just waiting for the response so we can support biometrics. If the phone doesn't have biometrics, we can enforce a pin. So again, it has another pin unlock. And there's the user is now signed in and ready to go. And at this point, we look at the settings. The user has the ability to update or change their password. Obviously, access their applications. And yeah, finally, we can actually uh, log out. And that's time of six minutes so we can see we've done everything from brand new user deployed enrolled and we're now getting to the point we can actually um, walk through where's my mouse gone there we go walk through and they've completed now what we're going to do now on the, on the second lot of demonstrations is actually look at how we can take this even further. And this is where we get to the point of merging identities. Now, when you work in the world of pretty much cloud first and also uh, with a federated identity, you have a single identity to access everywhere. So it's like one account will give you the keys to the kingdom. Now, what happens if you want to migrate from one provider, say Microsoft to Google or vice versa? or you've been part of a merger and acquisition where you now have disparate federated identities, but you now need to link them together. Then we're gonna look at how we can do an identity provider. And this is where we use us as the, the first step of authentication, then access applications, but also service provider. This is where you go directly to someone like a Microsoft, Salesforce, Google, et cetera. So as we move over, let's start uh, the next stage. So at this point, again, we're back into the uh, the main UD admin console, and we can obviously got the user accounts. You can select an account, and this is where we can click the, the merge button. And at this point, you can actually link multiple identities to a single identity. So if you think of the use cases we spoke about uh, first, it just makes it a far easier approach. So I've got an account already set up. So I've got two users called John. Uh, one's actually with a, uh, a Microsoft identity. One's actually with a Google identity. And you can see one's actually shown as inactive. And this is because we've merged the two accounts together. So even though it does exist, the account is not active. There's nothing the user can do to actually log in with this. The reason being is that identity has been tied to another separate identity. So go back and find out how they use John, do the same again, but this time we'll look at the uh, with the email of selab-online. When we look at the, uh, see, activate accounts all ready to go. There's the uh, unique email. But when we look at the application access, here we can see we've got the signed applications and also we've got a custom user uh, name, how we're actually managing rather than presenting the SE lab. So what we do, we do the login. Again, just keep things quick. Um, just got a, a static code rather than a push for the demo. But what it will show you is how we can actually work with that whole merged identity. So we just let the uh, user complete. At this point, there's the provisioned applications. We've got Office, Google, and obviously Dropbox. Now we merged it across. So here's the, the Microsoft one. Yeah, the Microsoft prompt. It's redirecting. And because we've got a, an access token, we're now signed into that application. And obviously we can go through, pick up now, just make sure everything is working as expected. Now, once that's done, we can see this is obviously with the 
John at selab.online account. Uh, we're going to jump back to the UD now, but this time we we'll click on the application provided to me. So, because it's been provided and I've got access to us as the identity provider, and now straight into Google. But this time I'm using the John at myskycloud.co.uk, so a completely separate identity. But we've managed to provide a merge and also that whole um, sync of uh, two disparate users accounts and provide the whole single sign on piece. So you can see it can provide a very powerful model. As we go through, um, we talked about a service provider. This is where you actually hit the service provider. So again, it's, it's taken straight to login.microsoft.online. And again, at this point, it redirects to us as the identity provider and the user can provide the access. So if you've got a single application, working in a service provider initiated connection is very beneficial. It means the users don't have to remember any other um, web address. And again, you see you have that signed straight through. But if you have multiple applications, it then makes sense to have more of the identity provider where you can use Secure Envoy to provide access into those applications through a single user portal area. And yeah, that pretty much takes us to the um, the end of that demonstration. So what we're going to do now, we're going to move on to the third. So as we said before, we talked about we talked about the cloud access, we talked about the application access, push how that works. But obviously, what about the legacy application? So what we've got here is obviously show you how we can make it work in a radius environment. Um, with Scrum Boy, without a lot of our agents, we're either web or radius based for the authentication, so it gives us great reach. And we'll take you through um, both the push and also the soft token, just so you can see. Now, we're going to simulate this with a radius simulator just to uh, go through some explicit controls. So, as we drill down, we've got all the different uh, settings, and then we've got the configurations. So within the configuration, we have a, a very uh, exponential set of uh, configuration parameters. Now for the demo, um, here's a client. So from a radius side, it's a very simple setup. You provide a name, shared secret, and IP address. Thereafter, you can activate, do you just want to do a passcode only or a MFA? But for radius, we have a very extensible set of pre-configured vendor support directly within our cloud application. We can then be more granular with passback of information, reply messages, attributes, to, to, to again, right through the way to trusted networks. Now, to make this work, we do have a agent. So it's a, a radius agent that acts as a proxy. So it takes the radius request accepts it and then falls it on into the cloud and there's obviously our tenant address as you saw almost identical to the active directory sync um, because it's all connected ready to go and we also have a client so we can just uh, prove connectivity prior to putting this in production so again very simple very quick to get operational now from the test side so here's the test client and he's going to run up there. So there's the local addresses we saw earlier. So here's my user, WA13. And we know this user is using the push. So there's their domain password. I'm happy to see it because obviously it's just internal, it's just a test. Now, when we click log in, you won't see anything happen because the next lot of interaction is via the mobile device. And all you see is on the response, we've got a logged in and logged out successfully. So our test case worked. But just to show you this in a little bit more um, detail, we're going to do the same again, but this time I'll show you this working with a OTP, so a one-time passcode user. So we'll go through the same test again, but this time we use a separate account for the user who set up with a uh, soft token application. Again, just for demonstration, they have the same password. And here you can see we've got three things. We've got the chat challenge, we've got a state, and we've got a reply message. And in the reply message, you can see it's got the enter the six digit code. We actually have state, so we can stick the sessions together because we now have a, a, a challenge and then a response. At this point, using open the token, 
um, successfully authenticated. And yeah, you can see how quickly we can actually plug all of this together. And very much keep an eye on time. We're, we're bang on time. We're at 41 minutes. So yeah, I'm happy to um, take uh, any questions that actually have uh, been posted in the chat. So if uh, my uh, colleague pull those out for me and then we can actually go through any questions. Here we go. So we've got a number of questions come through. Um, one of them is about how, how the pass is synchronized. Is it, is it one way? Um, is it bi-directional? Or again, for that whole onboarding. So we can actually do we can do the passwords in the two different ways. We can actually just sync for the initial connection and then uh, Scrimble can be the um, start of truth. Or we can actually have this as a bi-directional or as an ongoing. Um, quite a few other questions are coming in live at the moment. Um, there's obviously about licensing. So licensing is on a per user account. Again, it's not down to, so Per application, it's not down to using Radius, it's just one user account, irrelevant of how many cloud applications, Radius endpoints, uh, et cetera, you're using, whether you're using any of our agents for ADFS. So you get the complete portfolio. Another one is if you are an existing Scrimvoy customer, um, we have some very good migration tools. So we not only have that whole onboarding experience, but we also have the ability to migrate existing token or what we would call seed record data directly into the cloud to, uh, again, preserve credentials and uniques to a user, and then they can just continue working once we do that switch over. Again, that's typically repointing Radius to the, the sync agent to then, uh, for Radius or into a cloud application that actually having that federated. Uh, another question was obviously about the offline support. So again, big use case for us is with the, the Windows Logon Agent. And this is where we have a, a piece of agent code that provides uh, console access with two-factor. Now, other companies do this, but where they, they fall short is what happens when you're disconnected? What happens when you are you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't have data? How do you actually still authenticate? So we can still provide that security of a two-factor experience, and we can do that in an offline mode. And the way we do that is both with our um, soft token approach through the mobile app and also we can do this with a hardware or a physical token as well and all that's required is we have to have one condition of a good login and this is where we can then uh, download an encrypted record which we can store uh, and it's a scrolled through the machine but it allows when it's uh, opened up in a disconnected state we can actually then still work in and authenticate the user in an offline mode and when they go online, yeah, we just uh, continue as, as normal operation. So, just coming up to the, the 45 on the timeline, um, any other questions, what we'll do, we'll actually respond via email um, post this session. But um, for me at Scrimvo, I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance. I uh, hope you got some value from this and obviously good to show what we can do, and also from the, the demonstrations, you can see the simplicity to one, plug this together, two, make it work, and also from that end user acceptance piece. So yeah, very much keeping it uh, in mind of, the, of the, the, the target audience and our mantra of keeping identity simple. So I'd like to thank you for everyone today, and I'll, I'll pass back to Boardwalk just to close out the session. So you can always connect us with uh, our uh you know, my email IDs and uh, through your different channel account management. So you individual kind of, you know, uh, requirements and other, uh, you know, kind of services. Once again, thank us, a complete uh, you know, picket on our team and uh, thank you, Sonali, to organizing these, uh, you know, uh, session to make it successful. Thanks everyone, it's goodbye from us at Scrum Boy. Hopefully speak soon. Bye-bye.